For over 1,200 years, church bells have called the faithful to worship, helped us to celebrate triumph and tragedy. But the fact that they are one of the largest and loudest musical instruments in the world is often overlooked. This is something musical innovator Charles Hazelwood wants to change. Something about the sound of bells, even as a very small child, hearing them issuing from our village church, you get this amazing, unearthly, ghostly, sort of ethereal sound. The sense of the music kind of coming almost as if it were out of the earth. If I'm honest with you, I'm really sad about the fact that there's only one grand piece of symphonic music I can think of that really exploits the potential of, of towers near and far in a performance, and that's the 1812 overture. I mean, look, the reasons why you don't find more church bell or tower bell pealing in orchestral music is pretty obvious, isn't it? You can't exactly take an orchestra to a tower, and you can't bring the tower into the concert hall. But, you know, there's such a powerfully evocative part of Englishness, the English landscape, and they're great carriers of drama. So what I want to see is if we can go right back to ground zero, as it were, with these amazing ancient instruments and really make some fabulous music. With a track record of innovative and exciting performances, Charles wants to see if church bells can be used to make original music in their own right. I'd just love to hear what would happen if you had a three-note chord. These things have never been done, Charles. <laughs> You're pushing back the barriers. Charles is going to immerse himself in the world of bells and bell ringing. <laughs> he will discover what can and can't be achieved with these neglected musical instruments. I mean, it's like Heath Robinson comes to the bell tower, really, isn't it? <laughs> At the end of it all, Charles hopes to bring different worlds together in a unique piece of music, the like of which has never been heard before. Conductor Charles Hazelwood has given himself the challenge of devising and mounting a piece of music just for bells. And as the stage for his unique musical adventure, he has chosen the market square in the centre of Cambridge. When I came up with this scheme, I was very clear about the, the thing we needed, which is a central space like this, and close by, working, bell towers. Now that may sound like an easy thing to deliver, in fact it's not at all. The fact is in the UK at least 50% of all the churches that have actually got towers don't have bells either that work at all or maybe the bells have been removed. So I've searched the country high and low and I've ended up here in Cambridge because here in this wonderful square we've got three working bell towers. Fantastic. Over there uh, is Great St Mary. Just around the corner there you've got St Edward's and then just over there St Andrew the Great. All three towers in magnificent working condition. Great St Mary's, overlooking the market square, has dominated bell ringing in Cambridge for over 300 years. Here, in the Middle Ages, the university bell ringer would ring the start and end of meals, lectures and prayers. And it was here that the Westminster chimes were invented. The tunes Big Ben strikes every quarter hour. Hello. Hello. I'm Charles. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Hi, David. Hello. Good to meet you. David Pipe is the ringing master here at Great St Mary's, and George Unsworth is the ringing secretary. They have offered to help Charles in his musical adventure. I love the sound in between the strikes when the bell is on the yeah. move. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. sound. Absolutely, yeah. Their first task is to help Charles understand the basics of how bell ringing actually works. A bell has two strokes to it. We have a hand stroke, where you are holding onto the furry bit called the sally, and the back stroke. The most important thing is that what happens to this, after you've pulled it, it goes through the ceiling, through that rather small hole there. So if you're still holding it while it goes through <laughs> that rather small hole... <laughs> Let's face it, we've all seen those cartoons, Indeed. right? Yeah. <laughs> this is it. This is for real. It's not coming yet. Put your arms down. <laughs> right, you ready now? Hungry for it. Here yeah. it comes. I 
that and pull. That's it. The bells here weigh up to a ton and swing with huge momentum. There we go. Charles must pull with just enough force to ease the bell off its upright position that was good. and propel it around a full circle. You could feel it then. And right you, on the pull, cuff. you pull quite hard then. The other factor is timing. The ringer should pull just as the bell reaches the top of its swing. Pull too soon or too late, and he risks losing control. Oh, oh, oh. oh let go. <laughs> yeah, that's what goes. Yeah, on. that's it. <laughs> so what happened there? I thought it's come down, is it? It, it didn't go up. Right. You, were, you were pushing it up, effectively. But I. You held on a little bit, so how are your hands? Yeah. Hands are all right. Slightly <laughs> shooting pain up the back, I must say. Yeah. But there we are. All in a day's work. In the Middle Ages, bells were swung from side to side by a rope attached onto or near the head of the bell. It was the Reformation that changed everything. In a wave of anti-Catholic iconoclasm, church fixtures and fittings were destroyed up and down the country. As the nation's bells were recast and rehung, craftsmen took advantage of the latest technology and mounted their bells on wheels. Now ringers could control the timing of the bell. The direct result was change ringing, the sound of bells being played one after another that we hear every Sunday morning. Change ringing quickly became a hugely popular secular hobby. Groups sprang up in almost every town and city, vying with each other for recognition. There are now about 40,000 ringers across the country. But amazingly, the wheel mechanism and change ringing never took root on the continent, where they still use the medieval system. The ringers of Great St Mary's belong to the Cambridge Youths, one of the oldest ringing societies in the world. There's been change ringing in this room since at least 1724. So what's going to happen is that Patrick behind us is going to start calling pairs of bells to swap. And gradually swapping the pairs of bells will produce a different sequence. Um, and, and this is one that's called Whittington's. As nice as it may sound to the ear, no one in this room is trying to make music. The bells are numbered 1 to 12 from the highest to the lowest, and the ringers are simply swapping the order they're rung in to create ever-changing sequences of notes. Eight to nine. So that's number eight. Over number nine. Yep. Eight to eleven. This is called change ringing a system that has barely altered in over 350 years. And although it's simple in theory, it requires furious concentration. It's the raw material Charles has to work with. Oh, hi, that was amazing. Turn again Whittington, I do believe. <laughs> Incredible. Musically speaking, let's face it, bells haven't got a great deal to recommend them. They can only play loud. They can only play on beats. They can't even do dotted rhythms or syncopations. They certainly can't pick out melody. Plus the fact that bell ringers don't think in the same way as a musician like me. They don't think even in terms of tunes or melody. They're thinking in terms of numbers. Eight to eleven. So that's a challenge for me as much as for them to find some common ground in the middle. We don't want to end up with something which just sounds like a kind of artful experiment. We've got to end up with something which is just bloody good music. Charles is starting to understand the musical constraints of church bells and change ringing, but more challenges lie ahead. I've come up here to the top of the tower at Great St Mary's to sort of get the lie of the land, to see where my various musical components are going to be. So the market square's down there. Beyond that, you can see the Tower of St Andrew the Great, tower number two. And then over here, St Edward's. I've never conducted anything where the individual musical elements are this far apart before. I simply have no idea if I'm going to make it work. 
One thing that will greatly help create a harmonious piece of music is if the bells of the different churches are in tune with each other. Great St Mary's has a modern ring of 12 bells beautifully tuned in the key of D major. Charles II Church is St Andrew the Great. Rebuilt in 1842, the medieval church on this site used to guard one of the gateways to the old city. Now, the University Guild of Ringers hold their practice sessions here every Thursday night. Oh, hello guys. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. brilliant. They don't seem that loud, the bells outside. Are there windows in place or anything like that? Or is there it just that's what they are? large wooden sheets over the, all the louvres because there's a, a college just over the road. We've heavily uh, dampened the sound of the bells. Do you think you'd be allowed to take those, those off? They're mm. fairly permanent, mm. aren't they? Anyway, if you can't remove the uh, baffles, you can't remove no, the baffles. Yes. You've got eight bells here, haven't you? Yes. Eight bells, nice descending major scale, about yep. A major, I'd say, roughly. Does anyone agree with that? Well, the authority in these things believes they're in G. Does but, he? Um, <laughs> mm. That's open right. to dispute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I suppose it depends what part of the country you're from. We've all got loads of pitch. G or A, any ringing here won't be in tune with the D major bells at Great St Mary's. Charles' final church is St Edward's, just off the southwest corner of the Market Square. St Edward's holds a unique place in English history. Here, in 1525, standing in what is now called the Latimer Pulpit, Robert Barnes gave one of the first sermons of the English Reformation. Here, Charles will be working with Tower Captain Ali Finn. So we go through the tower. Here. Ali first became involved with the church in 1994 as part of a restoration effort to save its original medieval bells. They're amazingly old, aren't they? They look almost like Grecian urns. <laughs> yes. So this is the base of the old frame. Yeah. The actual oak frame that the bells were hanging in, which, as you can see, is quite fragile. Um, it's lovely you've been able to keep it, though, in essence, the yes. original structure. Yeah. All the bells here are 17th century or earlier, but Sancta Anna, cast in 1470, is one of the oldest ringable bells in the county. It's a bit narrow as you come through here. And here we are, on the gallery. But what a great view. Yeah. I mean, you can see everything going on down there, and more to the point, perhaps, they can see you at work. Yes, yeah, and you often catch uh, the little children, especially down, down in the corner there, they're, they're looking up to see how the sound's being made and all these people pulling on these ropes. At St Ed's, Charles has a ring of six bells in the scale of D major. They should match Great St Mary's perfectly. But they were cast over a period of 200 years, when bell technology was in its infancy. Right. So that's the tenor. OK, well, that's roughly an A. Very nice. <laughs> So now the oldest one. A very bright B. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that's really interesting about these bells, and I'd say more than at Great St Mary, is that when the clapper rests on the bell, it damps it very fast. You don't get that ringing on. This one will probably sound louder because it's nearer the door. <laughs> <laughs> Charles has now heard all the bells at his disposal, and no one set matches another. Nothing on this project is turning out as he had expected. He's full. Before I set out on this journey of discovery into bells, I had some, I think, what were actually what I realise now, totally outlandish notions of what might be possible. I thought in my mind that actually it would be perfectly possible, for instance, to ghost out the elements of a theme, a tune, in one tower and then about halfway through just pass it on seamlessly to the next tower, which should then pass it on seamlessly to the third tower. I mean, that's pie in the sky, completely impossible. Uh, the very idea that you can actually get towers in separate places to synchronize with each other, as I now realize, you know, is a completely nuts idea. But when you're working creatively, it actually gets interesting when you recognize the limitations around what it is you're trying to do. In a way, if the sky was always the limit, I'd be embarrassed by the range of choice.
Charles is ready to start devising his bell extravaganza. But before he does, he's come to visit Taylor's Bell Foundry in Loughborough. Up close and personal with bells, Charles has realized that each one produces a complex sound full of different notes. Taylors are one of only two bell foundries remaining in the UK. And it was here that the art of bell tuning was perfected more than 100 years ago. This is the main part of the works. The works was built here in 1859. Specifically for the bell Specifically foundry? Specifically for it. Across the road, through those double doors over there, is, is where the bells are, are moulded and cast. Down the far end, we've got the joiner shop, which is where all the woodwork that we need is made. So that's where the wheels are made. That's it, stays, sliders, all sorts of bits and pieces. And the really exciting bit for me is the uh, room over there, which is the tuning shop, where the uh, bells that come across from the foundry get tuned and turned into musical instruments. Every bell produces thousands of different notes called partials. As bellmaster, it's Andrew's job to tune these partials. So what we've got is a modern bell that's harmonically tuned. Um, if memory serves me, it's somewhere around about note B. Mm -hmm. But what we're actually hearing there is not just one note. It's, it's, um, there are five very um, obvious notes fairly low down in the human hearing range. The lowest is where the whole bell is resonating in and out, if you can imagine that and that's called the hum note. And now the next partial is an octave above that. Again, another note B. It's magic, isn't it? Beautiful. Yeah. And then we've got a minor third, which is the mournful sound that you get out of a, a church bell. Right, there it is. And then there's a, 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 another octave, another B, it's the, the nominal. That one is the most important one in terms of determining the pitch of the bell. Because although it doesn't come out very strongly when you hit it with a with fork, it's that one that drives the, the pitch that the, the ear perceives. If I strike the bell again... All of a sudden, you can hear all of those partials, and mine can reconcile it because it's just had it pointed out to it. Why is it that a bell produces so many notes? It's to do with the complexity of the shape. Um, you've got, if you like, the, the marrying together of two shapes. You've got this vase-shaped aspect to the bell where it, it comes up and it's flared out, and there are some modes of vibration that are involved in the whole body of the bell, uh, certainly the hum note, which is the lowest one that we can hear. In addition to that, you've got the ring-driven mode of vibration, which is, um, if you could imagine, lopping the top part of the bell off and just having a ring of metal, and imagine that vibrating in a mode that's effectively at right angles to the way that the whole body vibration goes, and that is the one that gives the very, very much more intense um, harmonics. Up until the 19th century, tuning a bell was an unsophisticated process that consisted largely of hacking chunks of metal from the rim of the bell. But in the 1860s, John William Taylor I became obsessed with the fact that all English bells sounded out of tune. For decades, he and his sons experimented until they had devised a completely new system of tuning. Using perfectly pitched tuning forks and a huge vertical borer, Taylor's started to reach parts of the bell which had hitherto been left untouched, allowing the main partials in the bell to be isolated and tuned. Machining metal out of the bell counterintuitively actually lowers the pitch of the bell. By machining metal, say, out of the corner of the bell, we can lower the fundamental. By machining the sound bow of the bell, we can lower the nominal. That's a lot of metal that's come out of there. Yes. So this is the computer program, and you see there's a, a discrete set of peaks which relates to each of the partials. A desired finish pitch, and then it tells you in cents, which is hundreds of a semitone, how far away we are from that. And having seen that, I can then relate that um, to how much metal needs to be machined off it in order to get the finished result. Obviously, this is of paramount importance, because if you took too much off, you'd blown it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't look worried. Well, we're a bell foundry. 
Taylors produced their first set of harmonically tuned bells in 1896. Since that date, they have cast and hung some of the most important bells in the country. Among them, in 2009, the 12 bells of Great St Mary's in Cambridge. Charles has decided that whatever music he creates with tar bells, change ringing must be at the heart of it. And one of the ringers from Great St Mary's, Philip Harris, has offered to help him compose something completely new for the event. From my side, I think there are several very attractive arrangements of bells. So I said we start with rounds, a straight scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's a very well-known change where all the odd-numbered bells ring first and all the even-numbered bells ring after that. So the interval... Dum, in dum, dim, dum, dum, dim, dum, dim, dum, dum, dum. Exactly, right. exactly. And that change is called Queen's. OK, so your challenge is to get to go from here to here, mm. but moving only one bell at a time. Oh, goodness, it's like doing a Rubik's cube. It is. We might start just swapping six and seven. What Philip is composing is called a method, a mathematical pattern for ringers to follow so that they can ring countless changes without repeating any. The earliest methods have names like Grand Sir and Plain Bob and were first recorded in 1668 by Fabian Stedman in his book Tintinologia. Methods allow ringers to ring changes almost endlessly, but any performance of 5,000 or more is recorded for posterity and called a peal. The longest peal that has been rung, which I was in and which David Pike was in, was 72,000 changes on six bells. That lasted a bit over 24 hours. Yeah. What did you do about, like, toilet breaks? <laughs> uh, that was slightly delicate. We. Uh, for food, drink and, and toilet breaks, as you might imagine, there are some challenges there. We managed to... This was ringing handbells, so we had two handbells each, so our hands went free. <laughs> Did so, someone else have to, you know...? No, um, right. <laughs> well, There was once a pill of 40,000 changes rung on tower bells, and for toilet breaks, so a bucket was passed around <laughs> for that. That was an all-male band. We, we had a, uh, a sort of arrangement uh, which uh, that babies more frequently are used to, really, to cover for our toilet breaks. So. Did you? And, of course, it must feel terrible if you are the one that lets the side down. Once when I was ringing a, a long peel, it, the ringing broke down after about 13 or 14 hours. Because we'd been ringing for quite a long time, one of the ringers tried to feed themselves. It was like a great tragedy watching the bell just go from order into chaos. So what did you do? You walked out with your tails between your legs. There was a bit of silence for a while, then we decided we would go to the pub and have a few beers and find our date when we could do it again. And in due course, we didn't manage to complete that here. <laughs> Anyhow, well, back to the work in hand. Okay. So. That should be a six. Two, four, six, eight, 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 eight. One, three, two, five, seven, four, nine, six, eight, eleven, ten, twelve, eleven, nine, seven, um, five, three, one. Well, my head is just bulging with numbers running through like some abacus gone mad. It definitely takes a very particular kind of mind, and a mind that I don't have, really. Philip, however, could eat, breathe and sleep numbers. He would feel complete comfort, I would have thought. It is really interesting to understand that within the world of music, which is a very broad world, there are some almost intangible things to some of us. You know, my whole approach to music, my experience in music and the way it's made has come from such a contrary position. Or not a contrary position, but a very different position from that. So I find it baffling. Interesting, but baffling. With Philip, Charles has now devised one element of his piece of music. But the limitations of tar bells and change ringing are still causing him concern. It's obvious to me that we should base the performance here in the Market Square. It's more or less equidistant between the three towers. But, and it's a big but, I had really hoped that the, the bell towers would be able to give me more melodic interest. But the fact is, for all sorts of good reasons, they're stuck in change ringing. I need another element. Also something which will root us here, to give us a reason to be here, to cement the whole thing together. In search of a solution, Charles has come to Bottisham, a small village about five miles outside Cambridge. Here at Mary Batten's house, the Bottisham handbell ringers meet every Wednesday night.
bravo. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Wow, it's so nice to hear that sound. I've been in that kind of wonderful, great big brash world, which is tower bell ringing for the last few days, and to hear the sweet, unctuous tones <laughs> of your handbells is a really lovely contrast to that. So I sense quite a lot of passion for handbell ringing around the room. How long have we been ringing? About 24, 25 years, yeah, I would say. Yeah. This team has been ringing 24, yes, 25 years. Yes, not always, not the same people, obviously. <laughs> so how long have you been handbell ringing? Five years. And how long have you been ringing? Five, five same. Years, OK, so you came into it together. Well, wow, that's an amazing thing. You know, I try and do things with my kids that go, Dad, it's embarrassing <laughs> being with you. How lovely that you don't feel this about your mum. <laughs> He's saying nothing. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intrigued to know that you've never played anything from memory, um, only because, obviously, the nature of it is that you are very, very yes. focused oh, yes. on what's in front of you. And we never <laughs> smile. <laughs> oh, oh, playing, no, no, you look like you're in pleasure, a pleasurable mode. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> you don't look grim. <laughs> but I'm intrigued because because what is music if it's not communication? And and so in a way, you know, when, when music really lifts off, certainly I find as a conductor is when uh, the orchestra with, with whom I work here are so familiar with the music, they're finding the the spaces in between having to hoover up the information. If you see yeah, what I mean. Yes. So mm. The difference with this is you're playing a part, and so it's not always as easy to pick up. Mm. the direction of where you're going. And that's such a valid point, isn't it? Because mm. normally with any melodic instrument, you are used to, 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 to spinning melodies yeah. and you play all the notes of that yes. melody. Whereas you are all kind of individual components within a larger yes. organism. Yeah. It's like a rehearsal, isn't it? If we've got one person missing, you haven't got the complete tune. Have you tried bringing bands yourself? A little tiny bit, not very much. <laughs> <laughs> Why, do you want to challenge me? <laughs> As with their weightier cousins, handbells have been around for centuries. In medieval times, they were used to ward off evil spirits and rung when someone passed away. But playing tunes on handbells really took off in the Victorian period. Competitions were held in the Bellevue Gardens in Manchester, attracting hundreds of teams. And in music halls up and down the country, tappers and novelty ringers became staple acts. It's the first time bar. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Oh, I'm glad you get things wrong. Right. But I tell you what, the real chance for me, I thought, like, blimey, it's suddenly a B flat. I've got a B and an A here. And I'm like, this is so terrible. Much to your abuse when I notice. <laughs> Thanks for the support. It's a completely different way of thinking. It's fascinating. <laughs> well, look, it's been great to meet you all. It's Thank you for, for letting me come to your to your session. And um, I'll be seeing you all soon. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, we look forward to it. Great. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Interesting time. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. All the best. Bye. 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 Charles' plan is to devise a performance which combines some church bell change ringing with some handbell tune ringing. But these are two worlds which normally never mix. You know, I could make a piece of music featuring bells work on a number of different levels. Uh, at the most sophisticated, it might be a wonderfully challenging experience uh, for the players. But I think what I, what, what's really clear is that, you know, there are certain limitations to the way that handbell ringers work, just as there are certainly limitations to the way that tower bell ringers work. I'm not going to be able to get them to do some wonderful extended thing with lots of kind of flashy passages, kind of fanfare-like moments. Indeed, I can't even create a piece which is going to involve too many different ideas. I think the key thing is going to be simplicity, so that everyone can kind of really lock into the groove, as it were, of one principal musical narrative. So I've got to be immensely careful about not being overly ambitious. And, you know, my instinct is always to try and push further, go, go further beyond. And I just have to rein that in slightly. Determined to keep it simple, Charles decides to base his final piece around one well-known folk tune. 
For a long time, it was popularly held that Green Sleeves was written by Henry VIII, a monarch with close connections to Cambridge. He founded Trinity College and completed the world-famous King's College Chapel. Now that Charles has chosen his tune, he must arrange it for handbells. The key challenge for me is to find ways of marrying what are actually very disparate things, tower bells and handbells. Our performance will have started with some very fiery change ringing. Then off the back of that, the handbells can start very, very nakedly and gently to pick out the tune. By the time we're getting into the second verse, gradually I'm going to start to unleash more harmony from the handbells, and the kind of figuration I'm going to use is based on the changes. I've got here, written out on a stave, the exact notes of the changes that would have been played in the first portion of the piece by the towers. You see, like, falling scales, ya da di da di da di da di da da bom that kind of thing is going to be the essence of the harmony I'm creating, so that the handbells have a direct correlation to what the tower bells have been doing. Charles has managed to gather 30 handbell players from across the eastern counties and borrow two five-octave sets of bells. <laughs> I've got some sympathy with Rossini right now. Rossini, amazing Italian composer, very fast composer, and he'd write operas in, in sort of record time, but he'd leave the overture till the end, because the overture is the first piece of music the audience hears. It introduces all the themes, all the main kind of characters of the drama, which will then unfold. So obviously, it's the last thing the composer invariably writes. And Rossini would apparently leave the writing of the overture later and later and later, on some occasions even to the very day of the first performance. And the theatre managers would be tearing their hair out, saying, when, oh when, is Rossini going to write the overture? And apparently they would lock him in a room he was a great lover of his food and his drink. They give him one plate of cold pasta and one glass of wine, and he wasn't allowed out till he'd finished. <laughs> Although some handbell players work from numbers in the same way as tar bell ringers, everyone here tonight can read conventional musical notation. The D on the quavers is yeah, the first sure. yeah. Most simply mark in their own parts. Right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, it's fantastic to have you all here. Thank you so much for giving up part of your precious Saturday to come and involve yourselves in this kind of experiment, strange and hopefully wonderful musical experiment based around bells. Now, the tune that I want to use at the heart of this piece is Green Sleeves. It contains that kind of essential English quality, what Shakespeare called the dying fool. In other words, it's essentially melancholic, as I suppose we all are, essentially a little melancholic. You know, it does rain a lot in our country. And the thing about the dying fall, if you think about it, da di da 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 dying fall. Da da di da 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 dying fall. Right, and that repeats. Brief burst of sunshine in the chorus. Da 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 dying fall. Da da di da da da. Right? There we are. That's the English race personified in melody, as far as I'm concerned. So. Uh, let's have a little go and see how we get on. The nice and slow, one, two. Gong, one, two, three, one, two. Good, 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 good. Ladies and gentlemen, fantastic for a first effort. Fantastic. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look carefully at bar 66. Hands up here who's a, a tower bell ringer. Two. Well, I'm very pleased to say to you that Queen's has found its way into green sleeves at exactly this point. Da da de da de da be da de da de da. Right? Hurrah! The tower bell comes to the handbell. So, let's try from 66 and see how we get on. Mmm, there's a sudden and very spicy harmonic shift there, ladies and gentlemen. 
suddenly an F sharp major seven, which uh, should shock the hell out of the audience. <clears throat> we'll just have a long pause on that magnificent chord. Now. Bravo, ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening's work. Thank you very much. Charles is keen to find every means possible to draw his church bells and his handbells together. In his arrangement of green sleeves, the handbells imitate the church bells. And now, flying in the face of everything he's learned, he's going to try to get church bells to imitate the handbells. For this experiment, Charles has chosen St Edward's. Hi, yeah. oh, Ali, how's it going? Nice to see you. Yeah, and you. And Ali has brought along steeplekeeper and engineer Tom Ridgman for help. Hi, um, Tom. Tom's steeplekeeper here. So you, you get the essence of what it is I'd like to achieve. You want chiming. You, you want music rather than just our plain old uh, bell ringing routine. Yeah. We've yeah. got at the heart of our piece green sleeves, and it would be amazing to think that these six bells could play their part in actually sounding out elements of that melody. And I'm very aware that with you know, the method of change ringing, that's not going to be possible. Yeah, that's right. But there's a system that they use in churches called Alicum Chimes, where they put hammers on the bells and they use strings and pulleys and stuff, and they can play them a bit like pianos that you can just play notes on. So you're literally controlling the clapper hitting the bell? But, yeah, they normally have special hammers that attach to the bells, but we, we, we don't have that, but we can rig something up that sort of vaguely simulates that. Fantastic! That's kind of reasonably rigid. Tie around the clapper between the ball and the flight. Tom's plan is to use string and a pulley to attach the clapper directly to the bell rope. Right. There we go. It's <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, it's like Heath Robinson comes to the bell tower, really, isn't it? I think you know, we're on something, aren't we? It's so exciting that, uh, you know, it's, it, they're blazing a new trail. They haven't tried this before. But it does mean that we could play something of a, of a green sleeves, well, a fragment of the green sleeves melody on these bells. I'm, I'm really thrilled. I wonder if they'll be loud enough. But, you know, we'll only know by trying. That works. <laughs> when Tom and Ali have rigged all six bells, they gather the ringing team to see if they can make musical history. So if we were to do the first phrase, we'd be going... Um, five, three, two, one. Should we just try that? Yes, yeah, so you're first. So I'm five, yeah. you're three, yeah. two, one, right? So... <laughs> Hear that? <laughs> Yay! The first four notes of green sleeves! <laughs> amazing. Surely the first time ever in this amazing old tower. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Should we now extend it? Obviously, we're missing a note because, strictly speaking, we go five, three, two, one, that one, two, four, six. OK, so just see how far we get there. Yeah, but you will need to come down. All right, oh, oh, yeah. here we go then, so... delighted with that. Do you think Henry VIII would be thrilled? Yes. I oh, think definitely. he'd be thrilled, wouldn't he? And the other thing that's really historic about what we're doing, it seems to me, is that we are ringing dotted rhythms. Dum, dum, ba, be, <laughs> ba, ba, be. Now, you never get dotted rhythms in, in change ringing, for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. You just get... A, yeah. Right? Yeah. These bells must be thinking, what on earth <laughs> is going on to us? <laughs> Things are starting to come together. The only thing Charles is missing is a rousing finale, something he hopes the ringers of Great St Mary's can help him deliver. 
So what I'm really excited to hear is what would happen if you had a chord. Yeah. For instance, just two bells, then three bells, then four bells, then oh, five. Is that, is that really hard to do? <laughs> that would be pretty hard to would do. Would it? But uh, we're going to do this. We, OK, we'll, we'll do this. So Phil's going to start, <coughs> all right? And we'll say two whole pulls, and then two whole pulls, two whole pulls, and everyone joins in two whole pulls later. OK? Everyone's going. She's gone. <laughs> Playing chords on church bells is rare. Sometimes on special occasions or at the end of a wedding ceremony, all the bells of the church will ring in unison. This is called firing, but it's never done quite like this. Stand. Oh, you've made an old man very happy. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. You were grinning from here to here well, as yes, well. Yeah. Well, we don't do that every day. Or every, <laughs> every year. Really. If you're all in such great control of your bells, presumably you could get periodically slower. You could do a rallentando. You could do a rallentando, yeah. Yeah. But and how would that work? Would someone be calling? Would you, oh. would you call an upbeat or...? <laughs> these, things ha these things have never been done, Charlie. They're just... <laughs> You're pushing back the barriers. I'll push it back. Yeah. Okay. So the only other thing I'd like to do is a more tuneful firing. I'd just love to hear what would happen if you had a three-note chord. Yeah. I can guarantee this is the first time this has ever been done. <laughs> yeah. Rallentando. Amazing. Really amazing. We need to practice that. Of course. <laughs> but the principle is a good one. And it's so those two yeah. chords are so beautiful. Yeah. Charles now has all the elements for his final performance, and the groups are busy rehearsing their parts. But with everything going full steam ahead, Charles is taking a day out of his hectic schedule. Hello. Are you Trevor? I'm Trevor. Hello, Charles. Good to meet you. Thank you for having Welcome me to here. Bourneville. Yeah, Charles has come to Bourneville, the model village created by the chocolate manufacturer George Cadbury in the 1890s. And he's here to see an extraordinary instrument, a cross between a church tower and an organ called a carillon. So now we have the uh, carillon right in front of us here. There are 48 bells. 48 total. bells? 48 <laughs> bells. The largest bell, which is the one right at the top there, is three and a quarter tons in weight. And the smallest one is 12 pounds in weight. And it's chromatic four octaves, but with the lower C-sharp missing. The first carillon was built in Belgium 500 years ago. Despite widespread use throughout the Low Countries, carillons didn't make it over to England until George Cadbury had this one built in 1906. <laughs> Trevor has been playing here every week since 1965.
plumbing. What do I need for that then? That was extraordinary. Whatever you think he's worth. <laughs> I mean, he started off with quite a neck with the quavers, and I saw yeah. this semi quavers go. I thought, oh my yeah. goodness me, how on earth is that going to be possible? Yeah. Whoa. One thing that you are absolutely mm -hmm. able to get with this machine, this instrument, is light and shade. One of the things about uh, tower bells, of course, is that there is really only one dynamic level. You can't affect how absolutely. hard or otherwise the clapper hits the bell. Here you've got a lot of control. Total control, yes. This mechanism here will either shorten or lengthen the, the linkage between the clapper and the, and the key. So you've got that potential for pianissimo or... Fortissimo, yeah. And of course the other thing, that makes this different from a standard keyboard instrument is that, of course, you can't play chords, static chords. What you can do is arpeggiate, but that means you're very That's busy right. filling in the harmony all the time. Absolutely. You can't just put a chord down. Although you're playing a piece of music that may have been written for the piano or some other instrument, you've got to try and um, produce the sound that was intended by the composer for the original instrument. And that involves doing a lot to convert it into music and to make it passionate, if that's the word, um, does require effort. You need to exploit the full range of dynamics that the instrument's capable of giving, from the very loud, and obviously can be very loud, mm. or very quiet mm. as well. Right, can I have a go? Certainly you can, yes. You mentioned this evening him. All right, so far. Well, that's a very yeah. familiar tune in Bordeaux. <laughs> Charles is an organ scholar who has performed in public countless times. I've slightly gone over, haven't I? God, blimey, it's very, very weird. <laughs> but the technique used to play a carillon is like no other instrument. Um, da -de -da -de. Something like that, and then how does one employ the left hand? My goodness me. I really could only do right hand and We could do a duet, just... you know. Yeah. Charles has now experienced the full range of music bells have to offer. <laughs> With nothing left to learn, it's time to unveil his unique bell extravaganza. Charles is going to be conducting the three church towers using a video link. This is a system common in operas where the conductor needs to signal to an offstage chorus, but it's never before been used to conduct bell towers. For the purposes of our piece today, GSM is one. Okay. Stags is two. St Edward's will be three. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> 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 With the help of Max and Katrina, Charles fits the bells of St Andrew the Great with half muffles, leather pads designed to dampen the sound. I just think it's going to sound stunning. I've never actually ever heard um, a half muffled ring before. Yeah, the moment of truth is fast approaching. I mean, we've had rehearsal time, but it's been in isolated chunks. It's like these are all separate building blocks and it's only in the performance that we see if they fit together. So that is the most nerve-wracking thing about it. But you know, I'm a chancer, I'm one of life's chancers, and in a way that's why I like performing, because when you get out there, the only way is forwards. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. We are here today to celebrate something very, very special and deeply ancient within our culture, and that is the music of bells. And we are, ladies and gentlemen, going to attempt something for you now which has never, ever been attempted before. We are going to attempt to make a special piece of music which combines three sets of tower bells and about 30 hand bells. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the bells of Cambridge, the sound of bells.
<laughs> Everyone, take, take a bow. Oh, well done, you. <laughs> I started this experiment thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if this very particular kind of music that, that church bells make, could it be expanded upon? Could it extend beyond its slightly narrow parameters? And what I suppose I've learned as a result of doing this project is that, no, it can't in one respect. Bells are hung and work a certain way, so change ringing has a very good reason for existing as it does. But it's answered to me a whole bunch of questions about what you might combine that music with. Not only the handbells and their lustrous harmonies, but also the idea of bringing another tower and then another tower to bear on it. The very fact of change ringing occurring as it has always occurred, in combination with another tower also change ringing, but offset, you create a very special kind of music. It's one of the most delightful outdoor musical experiments I've ever been involved in.